Yiddishkeit is a way of life. It is in the heart. It is in the soul. It is also the way you were brought up. It is something difficult to define. It is something you feel. You either feel or you don't feel. There are many Jews who don't feel. I feel. I may not be one to go to synagogue as often as one should. I am forced to work on the Sabbath because of my profession, which is against the Jewish law. One should not work on the Sabbath. But I am Yiddish through and through, in my blood, in my veins, in my thinking, in my feeling. And that is something that you either are or you're not. These are the last three Yiddish actors still performing in this country. Anad Zolnike, Bernard Mendelovich and Harry Ariel. They are the heirs to a hundred-year-old tradition of Yiddish drama, which could once boast of its own thriving theatres in London's East End. Now they are nomads, performing for charity to an audience for whom Yiddish is no longer their first language. The vast majority of Jews in Britain are the direct descendants of impoverished immigrants from Eastern Europe. There, Jews had lived for centuries in city ghettos or isolated rural communities called Städtler. Separated from the country around by its religion and culture, the shtetl provided a haim for Jews in an often hostile and impenetrable world. Mein hey male dort wo ich hab meine kindrische Jorn verbrau A religious education centered on the Torah prepared young men for adulthood in this strictly Jewish environment Barred from the national institutions of Poland and Russia Jews lived and worked their own lives with their own systems of welfare taxation justice and administration. The head of the shtetl was the rabbi. He had his Hasidim who used to come for the weekend to him in the house to the rabbi and they ate together and prayed together. Uh, the Hasidim, they have been working very hard to make a living. Uh, their profession have been very limited. They've been carpenters, tailors, shoemakers. They could not take any position as civil servant because the Poles wouldn't trust the Jews. In this unique shtetl life, 
Yiddish was the Mamaloshan, the mother tongue. It was spoken at home and at work, in contrast to Hebrew, the language of prayer. Yiddish was also the language of a rich oral folk culture, of singers and wandering entertainers. But in the late 19th century, Orthodox Yiddish culture was challenged by writers of the Haskalah movement who introduced a secular Yiddish literature in the Western tradition. In 1876, Avram Goldfaden staged the first professional performance of Yiddish theatre. Theatre entertainment amongst Jews existed for many years, but as, a, as an organised thing, as a theatre, you know, a sort of a European concept of theatre, has only been going among, uh, probably for just over a hundred years. Goldfaden, with the beginning of Goldfaden, and uh, the authorities simply did not allow performances amongst you know, organised performances in Yiddish to take place. And uh, until 1905, the Russian Revolution, it was completely forbidden. So they found various ways of overcoming it. And um, with the beginning of the revolutionary movement, and uh, in the uh, independent Poland, where a democratic state, um, Jews were given equal rights, supposedly. And there were many thinkers and many writers. And um, as we had developed the language, there was a need for it. And there was theatre of every kind. So there was very light entertainment, just like I suppose in any other country. There are people who want the very light entertainment. But for the more serious public, there was very serious theatre. It was taken from the works of the well-known Yiddish writers, but you had great dramatists writing specifically for the theatre. The, the Yiddish theatre always had portrayed the Jewish way of life in Poland, which differs from an other, because we live in a, in a time where we have been persecuted, tragedies, that we had to run away from home, that we had to work hard and be persecuted and, and life stories. As the atmosphere for Jews in Eastern Europe grew more hostile, many thousands fled to the West. Amongst them were actors and dramatists from the young but increasingly popular Yiddish theatre. It became primarily an immigrant theatre and had to rediscover its audience and find a new role within the Jewish populations of Paris, New York and the East End of London. With the immigration of Jews out of Eastern Europe in the 1890s, plays began to look at the predicament of the immigrants, the dilemmas that faced them, um, conflict between a traditional generation and a younger generation who were becoming more assimilated, a nostalgia for the life that they had left behind in Eastern Europe, um, families that were divided um, between the New World and the Old World, um, pr the problem of young girls being tempted into what was called the white slave trade, prostitution, and those sorts of themes. One of those who fled to London was Jacob Adler, whose Russian Jewish operatic company performed a wide range of plays in the many Jewish workers' clubs of the East End. Occasionally, a hall or theatre could be hired, but in 1886, Adler's company moved to 3 Princes Street, London's first purpose-built Yiddish theatre. But just one year later, disaster struck. Panic after a false fire alarm led to the death of 17 people. After this, the Princess Street Club never regained its former popularity and soon had to close. Later, Yiddish actors could perform at venues like the Pavilion Theatre in Whitechapel, which came to be known as the Drury Lane of the East. By 1906, it was established as the home of Yiddish theatre in London, with great actor managers like Zygmunt Feynman. It was in Feynman's honour that a society was formed to build the grandest Yiddish theatre of all, 
the Temple of Art, which opened in 1912. I think I told you the story of the Jewish people in London. They tried to open their own opera house. There was a purpose-built theatre in the East End. And money was donated by theatre lovers and shares. My father, God rest his soul, he bought shares in it. And the idea was to purposely, uh, to purpose build a, a theatre, to have to play Jewish opera three days a week, Jewish drama and Jewish comedy. And they brought the finest opera singers from all over the world, and the act, best actors. And they opened up with a flourish and they named the theatre The Temple. And the man behind it was a great actor named Zygmunt Feynman. And the thing ran for ten months and folded. Because the ordinary man in the street opera was way, way above him. He couldn't understand that a man who'd just been stabbed would lay down and sing an aria before he died. There was no formal training for the Yiddish stage, but many family troops. Anna Tsolnika started acting in Romania at the age of two. In 1933, her family arrived in the East End to join a Jewish community that was by now well established. They moved into number 33, Broomhead Street. Now the street, Broomhead Street, now that was something. That, uh, alas, it is no more. It is a big estate now, not far from here where we live now. But Broomhead Street was a shtetl. A shtetl from Eastern Europe plucked out and put down in the commercial road and named Broomhead Street. First of all, all Jews lived in Broomhead Street. Both sides of the street were all Jews. And everything a Jew needs, he had in that shtetl, in that street. If he didn't wish to, he didn't have to leave the shtetl. He had everything he needed. He had a synagogue. That's first and foremost to a pious Jew. The Brichaner Shul, it was called, the Brichaner Synagogue, after a little town called Brichan in the old country. Then there was a kosher butcher, a Jewish grocery shop, a Jewish greengrocer, there was a boot mender, there were tailors. Broomhead Street was a dead-end street. Right down the bottom was a court, and right along the court there were all tailor shops. They, they were tailors working for higher masters somewhere else. So ev everything the Jew needed for his livelihood, he had in the... The only time he had to go out was to the baths, to go to the uh, public baths, which was in Exmouth Street, further down Commercial Road, or on Saturday or Sunday or whenever he chose to go to the Yiddish theatre. He had to leave the shtetl to go to the Yiddish theatre. Otherwise, he had a, it was a real Yiddish shtetl. And of course, at that time, everybody spoke Yiddish. Anna Zolnika acted in her father's new Yiddish theatre company, which played at the Adler Hall from the late 1930s and throughout the war. These were their most prosperous years, and the company even received a small grant from the Arts Council. This enabled them to produce more lavish plays from the Western classical tradition. One of the most memorable was a literal translation of Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. That's when my father, as his soul, played Shylock, and I played Portia, and that made history. It was the first time that a daughter played Portia to her father, Shylock. We also had the opportunity and the lolly to bring over from Poland uh, a very well-known Yiddish director, Jacob Rothbaum, who directed uh, Goldfaden Dream, a musical extravaganza. We had Milo Sperber, a German refugee director who works for the BBC to direct, uh, a, again, a Yiddish translation of Bridie's Tobias and the Angel. And it was a wonderful, exciting period of time in the Yiddish theatre. And it was the first and only time ever 
that the British Arts Council recognised the Yiddish theatre as a place of art. The Merchant of Venice was very successful, but such classical productions formed only a part of the traditional repertoire. For above all, Yiddish theatre was a popular theatre. It reflected the memory and entertainments of the shtetl and the values and experiences of its people. The most popular plays, as ever, were light musical comedies, during which the audience participated freely in an atmosphere of close belonging. A Jew in, in visiting a Yiddish theatre to see a Yiddish play feels at home. He likes to do what he likes to do as he, he does what he pleases. The same Jew in an English theatre will behave himself. And that is the difference in, in the audiences. In an English theatre, uh, it is theatre uh, as, as the world knows theatre. The Yiddish theatre has salt and pepper uh, and a little vinegar on it, with a little garlic. <laughs> it's very flavoursome, very, very flavoursome. And the audience is so too. They live with you. They, my father always used to say, in the Yiddish theatre, the audience like a zing, a lach, un a prayer, a song, a laugh, and cry, and a tear. You must laugh, you must uh, have music, and you must cry your eyes out. If you don't get the three in one, they didn't get their money's worth. <laughs> there was always the same routine, there was always a romantic hero, and there was always a tragedy, and there was somebody coming from Poland, starving, hungry, and then you had the comedy act, or the, uh, it was always the widow with the uh, romance going on in the stage. It was always the same formula. Yes, I can remember the plays, all the old songs, we used to sing all the old English Yiddish songs, and there was some lovely ones, I remember very well. It was very, very dramatic, and unless they all cried their eyes out, they were not happy. It wasn't a good piece, but when they all were sitting there crying, that was a wonderful, wonderful theatre. <laughs> The immigrant generation began to realize that although many of them had left because of the poverty and the persecution of Jewish life in Eastern Europe, uh, there were many values which they found it increasingly difficult to hang on to in their new environments, which they, which they realized as they grew older that, that were, the, were the values that they actually most cherished. And those are the values which the theater celebrated, and, and the, the same things which had been satirized when the Yiddish theater was young increasingly became bathed in a sort of nostalgia and, and homeliness, a coziness. Um, as time went on.
Gib mir ein paar Maseltoff, ich mach Hasse an meine Tochter. Maseltoff? Mit Masel sollt ihr leben? Nein, ich will praven die Messe hassen. Also, wie mein Seidepfleck mir erzählen? Wie gedenkt's noch, was dein Seidepfleck erzählen? Zieh ich gedenk? Schabes, den Haschmusches, wenn in Himmel fängt man noch in Sterben, legt mir die eine Klacht, dem Seidus meistern auf uns Sterben. Am meisten wie verkischt um Schäden, aber wenn Melch euch seht, nur mit Schrecken sieht, der Zeit in Seppes Freilachs. Seppes Freilachs willst du hören? Der Seid in einem Tag schmeckt Habeke, verknetscht im Stern, in Hebt und Klären, getracht und geklärt, sich zu schmeckt, in die so Kinderlach, Herr! Am meisten, am Freilachs, Ähm ist da gegurt, nicht euch gebracht, wie man hat a jüdische Hasse ne gemacht. Zu neues Geburen sind nun in weit Kuss und sah den Kalles an der Schuche. Das ganze steht alle in den Kein, die kämen den schon was und Ruche. Stehen, kass nur in der Bach ne schreit, steht, steht, steht. Kussen Kalle fast und ihr Fall des Wertchen spät. Die Weiber nehmen die Kalle, im Ersetzer weg du im Mitten Fahrerhalle. Der Hussenkind mit Macher Punim, im Deck der Kalle zieht das Punim, das Fiedele weint in die Weiber sich glücken, wenn der Bach nimmt die Kalle was um. Oi, zoek der bad, ngoi, kal, in juk, al, in juk, lug in bein. Fin ein tun, bis dem er nicht dus, wusste bis bis nach und gebein. A wechseln in die Jurn, die Sorglose, die Freie. Die wär stets der Weibel, soll seiner Weiber getreie. Weil sie kriegen heintige Zeit, na Mann ist nicht in Katowes. A heintiger Mann ist noch ärger, in der Malle Hamuwe. No, sie kriegt ein Kuss, neuf mir als ein Jur, nur sucht ein Lehm zu sein, und das nicht. Hei, Barle Hamur! In später geht die Macht mit Teins der Zippe, in Teit die Weiber legt sich mit Quass, in zwei Schamussen brennt in die Schippe, in Städten sie ja Reusse mit dem Gas. Mit dem Kuss nun ein weißen Kittel, ein Jahr nur kerst der Weimel Hittel. Die Kahl in weißen Ungetun, der Eul und Zint auf Dune Sohn. Ein Reus in ganz schön alle, die Interfiere für den Kuss in Kalle. In es wird ein größer Simch, es wird ein größer Freit. Die Bub ist hier allein, damit es wird ein zu gehen. Dann habe ich an der Kuss zum Zerbrecht der Gruß. Mazeltoff,Mazeltoff,Mazeltoff,Mazeltoff,Mazeltoff,Mazeltoff,Mazeltoff,Mazeltoff,Mazeltoff,Mazeltoff,Mazeltoff,Mazeltoff,Maze
So, you see, the Yiddish theatre was very important because it was intimately concerned with the whole question of identity and, more importantly, it was a theatre of the people. It was, um, uh, it was for the people, it was about um, issues that people clearly understood. Um, the, the, the plays were about everyday life and when they weren't, it gave people the opportunity to extend through the imagination in their own language. The Grand Palais in Commercial Road was the last great centre of Yiddish drama in London. While the reputation of the Adler Hall was based on its artistic achievements, the Grand Palais found enormous commercial success. In 1944, they put on their most famous and longest-running play, The King of Lampedusa. When people hear the name The King of Lampedusa, they think it is a fictitious name, but it isn't. There is an island of Lampedusa at the tip of the Italian peninsula. And uh, it so happened that in June of 19... 43. A pilot, a British pilot, happened to be a Jewish boy, name of Sidney Cohen, flew his plane over the island of Lampedusa and realized that his petrol was running low and he had to land, otherwise he would crash his plane. So he radioed back to base to tell his superiors that he's forced to land on the island of Lampedusa. Would they please send some help? The islanders had heard of a pending invasion by the Allies. When they saw this plane, this British plane, swooping down on the island, they thought this was the advance party of the invasion. They came running towards this single pilot and one British plane with white flags flying, and they surrendered to him. Hence the name, by his mates when he got back to base, the King of Lampedusa. The centrepiece of the King of Lampedusa was the second act in which a dream sequence in which uh, Maya Tselnikov, the, the, the tailor, the father of the pilot, imagines that his son has become ruler of a Jewish state on Lampedusa. And the stage had a throne which was flanked on the one hand by the Union Jack and on the other hand by the white and blue Zionist flag. So, so it was a play which expressed both patriotism and the hopes for, for a national homeland. And perhaps that was one of the reasons that that sort of timeliness was one of the reasons for its particular success. It was so factual. It was so, uh, it was such a thing of the moment that by the time we finished the play, which ran for eight consecutive months, ten performances a week, Jews and then non-Jews came to see the King of Lampedusa. We played to packed houses every night. People who had never been to the East End, let alone to a Yiddish theatre, couldn't, didn't know where it was, the Grand Palais. They phoned up, how do we get to the East End of this Grand Palais of yours? Uh, came to see the King of Lampedusa. Every daily, every weekly, every journal, every wrote and praised the King of Lampedusa. During the 1950s, the Grand Palais remained as one of the only venues in the world which still put on regular seasons of Yiddish plays. From 1961 it doubled as a bingo hall and finally closed its doors in 1970, bringing to an end a 90-year-old tradition of Yiddish theatre in London. Today the building is used by the rag trade. With me the Yiddish language has always been with me uh, as, as a kid and I always spoke it and uh, I tried to speak it. I always heard it in the home, but uh, with me, uh, Yiddish was going to exist forever. But apparently Mr. Hitler had different ideas. The Jewish East End has virtually disappeared. In 1939, 11 million people spoke Yiddish throughout the world, but the Second World War decimated the remaining Yiddish communities in Eastern Europe and the new state of Israel adopted Hebrew as its national language. New immigrant communities have moved into the East End. The second or third generation Jews have accepted the terms and the tongue of English society and departed to other areas. The synagogue has become the mosque. Now the East End has the richness of a different culture and new entertainments 
have taken the place of the Yiddish theatre. As I see it, in honest truth, after us, Yiddish theatre as it was known will not be any more. What I can visualize is a group of amateurs, hopefully they'll be good ones, will get together, will know the language well enough to be able to perform in Yiddish with someone to teach them. Hopefully he'll be a good one as well. They will rehearse for a length of time a Yiddish classic and will present it once a year maybe or twice a year for three or four performances or maybe one week. And that will be the Yiddish theatre as I can visualize it for the future. But Yiddish theatre on a permanent basis, a building where you could say this is the Yiddish theatre, where Yiddish performances are being performed nightly, where you can go into a box office and buy a ticket and go in and see a performance with Yiddish actors, professionals from all over the world. I can't see this anymore. Oy, 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 bell. My Mein Heim, alle dort, wo ich hab, meine kindrische Jorn verbrach. Oi, 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 Bell, mein Stöweit, alle Bell. Mein Heim, alle dort, wo ich hab, meine kindrische Jorn verbrach. Jeden Schabes fleig ich läuf mit alle Jingle gleif. Sitzen unter die grünen Kebei, malacht warten, stehen da lach in Zeit. Oi, 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 Bell, mein steht alle Bell. Mein Heim, alle dort, wo ich war, meine kindrische Jorn verbracht. 